Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for part one of an important webinar series focusing on the path to developing and delivering a COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, though different parts of the world have managed the pandemic with varying levels of efficiency and competency, the collective global community is asking the same questions. When will we return to normalcy? And when will we have a vaccine and an adequate supply of it to help us get there? Today, our expert panel will help us understand the implications of vaccine hesitancy, including the social influences that affect individuals' motivations to be vaccinated, and practical factors that affect individuals' ability to act on that motivation and actually get vaccinated. Um, I'm Donna McKay, the Executive Director of Physicians for Human Rights. Today's conversation is the 26th in PHR's COVID-19 themed webinar series which since launching in March has brought together healthcare workers, scientists, and voices from the front lines to examine the implications of the pandemic through the lens of health and human rights, as we seek to bring science-based analysis and approaches to guide responses to this public health crisis. Today, we will hear from experts in vaccine deployment and compliance and infectious disease epidemiology. And I'm pleased to welcome our esteemed panel today and to introduce Nina Schwabli, who is our moderator. Nina teaches in the Department of Population and Family Health at Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health and is founder and principal at Spark Streak Advisors, a strategic consulting firm. She's served as director of the Open Society Foundation's public health programs, managing director at Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, and acting chief of health at UNICEF, where she oversaw programs in over 150 countries. She's a member of the Council of Foreign Relations, a principal visiting fellow at the United Nations International Institute for Global Health, and chair of Gavi's Evaluation Advisor Committee. Nina, thank you so much for organizing and for moderating this conversation, and I turn it over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Donna, and I'm really excited to be here. And first, just to thank Donna, Michelle, Kathy, Samantha, Alexa, and the, the team at PHR. I'm really pleased to be here today to moderate the first in a two-part series on COVID vaccines. There's been a lot of discussion in the media and human rights community on equitable access, how the vaccine will be distributed and to whom. These are, of course, critical issues, as are those related to clinical trials and regulatory approval uh, discussions, of which I've gotten a lot of airplay in recent weeks, including last night. But in these two conversations, we actually want to take a step back to understand the nuts and bolts of vaccine um, delivery and the implications for universal delivery. So we're posing a 101, which frames the question differently. Assuming that supply was unlimited, would this all be easy? Would our COVID-19 problems be solved? So to unpack these questions, today we will focus on a global phenomenon called vaccine hesitancy. And next week, we will talk about what it actually takes to get vaccines from a manufacturer into the arm of a person. We hope these conversations will help you to think about the extent to which vaccines really are the magic bullet for COVID-19. So the run of show today will be moderated questions for the first half an hour, and then we'll open the floor. So please submit any questions through the chat function, and the team will aim for us to get to as many of those as we can today. And now to introduce our amazing panelists. Heidi Larson is the director of the Vaccine Confidence Project at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, where she is also a professor of anthropology and risk and decision science in the Department of Infectious Disease and Technology. Heidi is a pioneer in the area of vaccine hesitancy and has recently published a book called Stuck, How Vaccine Rumors Start and Why They Don't Go Away. This is a must read. Robert Kanwagi is the program coordinator for the Ebola Vaccine Deployment Acceptance and Compliance Program. Robert, who's currently sitting in DRC, and Heidi's joining us from, from uh, the United Kingdom, has worked extensively in DRC, Uganda, Sierra Leone, Senegal, and Rwanda, on testing and deployment of new vaccines. He also has a particular expertise and experience in community engagement, which is, I hope, something we will explore further today. Welcome, Robert. So Heidi, to start, can you please describe what is meant by this term vaccine hesitancy? Is this a problem with regular vaccines like measles or tetanus that have been around for decades? Tell us about vaccine hesitancy. Well, vaccine hesitancy, um, actually the term is relatively new. Uh, it was really in um, uh, 
2013, I think it was when a WHO coined, not coined, well, coined the term in the context of vaccine, it was in the SAGE group discussions, the advisory group on, on vaccines. Um, and it, and it was, has not been my favorite term, to be honest, because I, it sends a bit of a negative signal, which is why we frame all of our work in terms of confidence, thinking a bit more like the consumer confidence index, but thinking of it <laughs> in a different way. But what is valuable about the framing of hesitancy is that it recognizes that the world is not divided between pro and con. And that's the value of the vaccine hesitancy framing, because it can be anything from a first time mother hesitating about a vaccine because she has some questions, she's not sure, she wants to make sure she's doing the right thing. So hesitancy isn't always a bad thing. It's a responsible thing. It depends on how much your hesitancy, uh, how strong it is, and actually what's driving it. And so I think in that sense, there's a difference between motivated hesitancy versus genuine anxiety and concern. And in the context of COVID, I think it's particularly legitimate because one, it's such a hyper uncertain environment. We don't have a vaccine yet, and we really don't know. So it's perfect. We have to have a little more empathy for the public's uncertainty in all these surveys we see being um, in the press. And, and Heidi, is this a new, is this a new, so you said that the, the term was coined resident re relatively recently. Is this a new phenomenon or have we seen it before with regular vaccines, what we call regular e uh, children's vaccines like measles or tetanus, or is this, is this a new thing? The phenomena is very old. Um, I mean, it, the first anti uh, vaccine league. It was actually was actually the anti-compulsory vaccine league was in the 1800s around the smallpox vaccine. Um, it was when it, it didn't start just because of the smallpox vaccine. It started when there was a mandate to take it, and that's what sparked outrage and and protests, not unlike we've seen in Berlin and London and in the parts of the U.S. So there has historically always been this tension between individual right to choice and uh, you know, the right for public health and, and community immunity. Um, that's increased over the years in different settings, also with the numbers of vaccines. But the other thing that goes back to the 1800s is this, this is in, in the 1800s, they talked about it being against God's plan. Now it's not natural. Um, but it is something that is the public has been struggling with. It's the whole nature of a putting a shot in your arm with some. I mean, it, it does, for in a very primal level, uh, provoke some anxieties, especially because it's often given to healthy people. It's a, a very different. People have a very different risk um, <laughs> dynamic when they're really sick. They'll take anything to make feel make them feel better. Um, but when you're talking about putting an injection with something that you might have some questions about, particularly when it's your healthy baby, we have to have a bit of empathy with that. <laughs> Thank you. Robert, you've, you've had a lot of experience with lots of different types of vaccines. Can you talk a little bit about, um, and I, I, I appreciate the confidence hesitancy, but what the hesitancy looks like on the ground? And again, is this, is this a new problem or what does hesitancy look like on the ground? Is this for me or Robert? It's for Robert, Robert. Robert. Yeah. Yes, he hesitancy on the ground is real. It, it does exist. Um, and this is not uh, specific to Ebola vaccine. Um, we have seen it with other vaccines, which are routine vaccinations. Um, we have seen it at individual level, uh, where individuals actually resist um, or hesitate to take vaccines, mainly guided by their religious, social, culture beliefs within the communities which they come from. In my own country, where I come from, uh, recently Uganda, there was a pastor who was preaching against. Um, a COVID-19 vaccine, if it's ever met, 
and uh, he was summoned by the, the police and questioned. And this caused a lot of um, um, negative feedback from the communities and the, his followers. So individuals actually drive um, uh, hesitance at community level or at country level. They can say, I don't want to take the vaccine. And I don't want anybody from my family to take the vaccine, not my children, not my wife and anybody that they have gone to, I call it, uh, usually call it the gatekeeper phobia. Uh, these are parents who say, mm, my son won't take the vaccine because I don't believe in vaccines uh, because of my religious and uh, cultural affiliations. There's also hesitancy that we can see in the community which is driven by vaccines mobilizing their communities to say no. But we can also see where it's organized community. We have Ram seen this in DRC. Robert, your connection is a little bit unstable. So maybe for just for now, uh, you might want to turn off. Okay. Your okay. Uh, I was saying that um, for countries like um, uh, where I am best now, um, we have seen extreme cases of vaccine hesitance where vaccination clinics are burnt down or attacked and um, stopped from doing what they are supposed to be doing. And then uh, also from a political level where politicians who are the decision makers, whether we're talking about the political leadership of a country saying, no, we don't want that vaccine in, that, in our country. We had, we had a, a, an actual incident here in DRC because we had two vaccines where uh, some of the politicians didn't think it was wise to have two vaccines in the same country against Ebola. And uh, they didn't want to make uh, necessary approvals for one of the vaccines. So it's real at individual level. We can see it happen. It's real at community level where community gets organized and says no to vaccines. But it's also real at political level where politicians um, say no to vaccination programs because one, because of their culture beliefs, but also because maybe they are not sure about the benefits of a certain vaccine and they are worried that it might have a negative consequence on their communities, which would cost them an election or votes. So it does happen and um, it takes a lot of engagement to convince them to, to become positive about vaccinations or vaccines. Robert, do you see this also? So there are diseases that people have never seen for which they're vaccinated. And then there are diseases which can be quite common, like measles, where people have experience with measles in their recent history. Do you see this also with some of those vaccines uh, for diseases which people actually have seen the consequences of? Yeah, uh, a common one is polio, uh, where um, people have seen the consequences and people are living with consequences in their families. And they still say no to the vaccine because um, they saw oh, this is a poison or this uh, will create infertility or this uh, will make my child lame or this will uh, disfigure my, 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 my children. Even where vaccines are routine and people know the benefits of these vaccines, we still see some levels of um, hesitancy. Great, thank you, Robert. Heidi, if we, if we pull this up 100,000 100, feet, you, you've done a lot of writing about some of the, the bots and the chats and the political influences. Can you tell us a little bit about um, some of the social and political drivers, about what has amplified this uh, to such a, what, what has amplified this globally? Well, I think it's, I mean, there are quite a few political drivers. I mean, distrust in, there's been, on the one hand, kind of distrust in the in the central government. Uh, if you're a marginalized group, particularly, um, and you don't trust the the majority government, um, when they come around with a with a vaccine or say your child can't go to school because of it, I mean that's a political issue. But you can also have, like Robert was just referring to, you can be okay with your central government, but you've got a local leader. Um, as in the, the boycott of the polio vaccine in northern, 
northern Nigeria in 2003-2004, the governor of the state boycotted any vaccination going on in the state. That was not at all what the central government um, was pr promoting. So you can see the same where the Organization of Islamic States, the higher authorities, say it's okay for the Muslim community to have a vaccine that has porcine, the gelatin, which is in the capsule for polio vaccines and also in the nasal flu vaccine. But then, uh, you know, an imam in here in Yorkshire um, would absolutely did not agree with that. And children were not getting their nasal flu vaccines because he decided that, you know, it was against the religious, so verdict, vid, verdict. Um, um, and so I think that leadership matters, who in where in the system, political or cultural or religious system you sit, what are the power dynamics? Um, and the, uh, so that, that, so that's from a driver point of view. Um, but in terms of the amplification of it, I think a lot of that is um, the, the hyper amplification of it has really been, I think, with the introduction of social media, it was already out there. But what's happened with the globalization of uh, social media and the rapidity with which uh, people can create things and, and spread them um, has really just amplified in other ways. And it's not just allowing the spread of information. It is an organizing tool. It's allowing um, uh, I was just, the round table I was at before was with, with a group of uh, social scientists. We were talking about community and community engagement, which is actually something we'll talk about here. But there are local communities, but there are also communities of like-minded people that may never may have never met each other, that are aggregating in ways they were never able to come together before. And what's happened is that they've reinforced each other's thinking and behaviors, and they feel like there's so many of them that they've got to be right uh, in ways that we haven't seen before. Um, and we have seen it in physical location where you get these groups of people, but it hasn't had this global amplification in the way that the World Economic Forum in 2013 uh, in their risk report talked about uh, digital wildfires, and I, I think it's a very apt metaphor. Great, thank you. And, and Robert, I mean, you've talked a little bit about an experience with a pastor. Are there other, how do you, how do you see this, the sort of, um, are these same political factors at play? Are these same community reinforcements again? Can you give a few examples of what you've seen around those issues? Uh, the issues, uh, for instance, um, we still have, um, this is true, that we still have politically aligned um, decision-making based on uh, colonial ties and, um, and uh, alignments. You, you, you still have, within Africa, where I come from, uh, countries making decisions uh, based on their colonial relationships. So if a vaccine comes from a certain country, and it's not political aligned to what the colonial order was, it, it is likely to receive resistance also from political leadership. The other is that um, decision-making um, in countries usually is so delayed um, because politicians, especially during elections, will resist introduction of new vaccines. In my country, it has happened before uh, in Uganda where a new vaccine, uh, HPV, was um, delayed for introduction because we are going into a campaign season. And there was a worry within the political class that supposing uh, we had a negative outcome or an uncomfortable incident within the community, how are we going to explain this to, to our communities? So they delayed it. Uh, of course, this was not public. They didn't say it publicly, but we knew from the work we are doing that this was something that was a decision being made uh, to politically favor a certain condition that was prevailing at that time. Then, I, again, from my own country where I come home, we have had a cultural leader stand up against government and say, 
nobody in my kingdom would take this vaccine because it is not good for my people. And um, the government and this culture, this is a very influential culture leader. And the government cannot go and arrest him, of course. Uh, they, they fear to respond to him, of course. So you need to engage him and see how he can then remobilize his own community to accept the vaccine. And in that particular kingdom, there were many cases of, of polio that cropped up uh, in, in those years in the late 90s and the early 80s because of this particular person who was saying no to vaccination in my community. He has now become a champion because he's still alive of vaccination programs. Uh, the, the queen of that king is um, ambassador for one of the UN agencies in the country and is promoting vaccination program. But it took a lot of engagement. Sometimes it is purely out of people not knowing what the facts are. But in the era of social media, like Aida said, it is becoming extremely difficult to understand who is telling the truth. Uh, because everybody is putting out something. There are so many online TVs, there are so many online channels that are coming up with people without any experience on vaccines. And there's a, a, a guy that I'm following in Kenya. He, he puts out um, a video every week on YouTube to talk about vaccines in the negative. All he says is in the negative. His approach about discussion of the COVID-19 is about business. Uh, this is meant to enrich people, to make money. And uh, there have been some advocates in Kenya who are actually following up with the government and following up with him to see how they can uh, educate him so that he becomes a positive change agent in the preparation of, of the vaccine when it comes up. Sounds like a lot, a, lot of, a lot of work and a lot of individual convincing. And now, you know, if we now turn to COVID-19, the question on any, everybody's mind, um, and in the context of what you've just described, which is baseline around vaccine confidence and vaccine hesitancy, what do you see as the main challenges specific to the COVID-19 vaccines and how might these differ or be similar to some of the challenges uh, that, that we've discussed? Maybe Robert, we'll, we'll start with you and then, and then move to Heidi. Yes. I think that one of the biggest challenges that I actually face as Robert also is too much information. There's too much information overload out there about COVID and the vaccines that is simply one dimension. It is top bottom. So every day there is something being said about the COVID vaccine. Today you hear um, there will be a vaccine at the end of the year. Yesterday you heard there will be no vaccine. So people are asking themselves, who is communicating the facts and the science? And all this information that comes down to people, and we're going to confuse the people in the process of developing the vaccine that we shall have a lot to undo when the vaccine is ready. So for me, that's one of the problems. We don't seem to have streamlined how to communicate about the development of the vaccine and the, how to, and, and, uh, and the COVID itself as a disease or infection to the people that we do not create some level of confusion within the communities so that by the time we have a vaccine and we are engaging communities to accept the vaccine, we have not created a lot of confusion. That's one of the challenges I see. The second one is what we have already touched. The new community, which never existed many years ago, which is social media community. I belong to the groups of WhatsApp for old boys. And I can tell you, there is no single day that COVID vaccine is not discussed, either by bankers, salesmen on that group, or by somebody doing agriculture. They have no good information about COVID vaccine, but everybody has an opinion. So how do we strategize? How do we strategize and create a strategy of engaging the new community the new virtual community. Because usually when we are talking about community, we are thinking about the geographical or physical community. That exists. But there's now a new global community which is more connected than the physical community. So one of the challenges I see is that we might so well with the physical community engagement, but not do so well with the virtual community engagement. And this virtual community engagement has a lot of influence on the physical community which will undermine the work that we are doing uh, 
with, vac with the COVID vaccine. Then the third one, which I could also say is uncoordinated messaging. It doesn't seem to be that we, we are well streamlined on what message is coming down. We, 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 we tend to get a lot of conflicting information, even from the science world, where someone says there will be no vaccine. This is a scientist by the end of the year. Then there is a pronoun there will be a vaccine. COVID-19 is not airborne. Then there's an pronouncement COVID-19 is airborne. That kind of communication is making work for some of us at the front line extremely difficult. Uh, because then communities begin to believe that this disease is a political disease. It is created for a purpose. And then before I hand over to Heidi, to, there, there is a something also that is bothering me about COVID vaccine is the fact that we have a lot of politicians and businessmen who have become spokespersons of the COVID vaccine. This is not common previously. It, I, I don't remember ever seeing a businessman or a politician talking about the development of the Ebola vaccine. I saw them talk about it when it was ready for deployments as advocates. Now we have politicians and businessmen as spokespersons of the COVID-19 vaccine, which is also already creating, especially in the social media community, already creating a buzz of saying, is this vaccine really about public health good or is it about business? And then it goes to the community and then you have a lot of debate whether this is about the public health good or it's about business. I think those are some of the challenges that I see that we are likely to face when it comes to the COVID vaccine deployment and usage. Thank you, Robert. All super formidable challenges. Heidi, do you want to build on that? Yeah, I think uh, you said it so well, Robert, and it's not just, I mean, whether you're in Uganda or in, um, you know, the center of Europe or the U.S., um, this this issue of suspicion is is really um, what's disturbing to me is what how vaccines have um, gone from being something that was kind of accepted as as normal as brushing your teeth. And now is just from, you know, people just, they, um, the default is question. Uh, the default is something's fishy here. Um, and I think uh, particularly in this COVID uh, environment, which is so uncertain, uh, kind of every part of our life has been turned upside down. Um, and the reality is we don't have a lot of clear information on the COVID vaccine, but what we do have information on that we need to communicate about now is the fact that we're not shortcutting old processes here um, to make a COVID vaccine. We have absolutely new platforms and technologies. And that is a good thing and it's also a scary thing. It's already enough to have a brand new vaccine and one of our biggest issues around acceptance around the H1N1 vaccine in the, pan in the H1N1 pandemic was it's just too new, it was made too quick. And that's a, a very familiar vaccine, the flu vaccine. It was a different strain, but, but this is a totally new vaccine, a brand new virus that we're still trying to figure out and by the way, we're using mRNA and people are already anxious about, whoa, wait a minute, what's that? They're messing with our DNA is another thing that I'm hearing a lot. Um, and in particular, Bill Gates, who's investing in all this, you know, what's he doing that for? It's this kind of new way to control us. Um, this anxiety about being controlled and and it's really, it's not, if we focus on just the value of vaccines and vaccines are good, we're, we're not getting it. Um, and I think what we need to do is rather than from a communication perspective, rather than um, 
putting out what we think is important for the public, which is the default approach of the public health community, we need to do be a much better job at listening to the concerns and, and really being responsive to them in ways that were, are much more, um, much more responsive than we're used to. Uh, it's the work that I've been doing with Robert in the last five years around Ebola vaccines. You know, I think one of the things that was turned out to be so successful about it was we had kind of real time community listeners in, in the areas where we were doing the trials. And whenever they heard something new, you know, we would go to the clinicians or go to and say, listen, this is what the perception is. Next time you have an interaction, work into your conversation why you don't have to worry about X or Y, or we understand your concern, but just to help clarify. And because it was in real time, it would rein it in before it traveled. Um, this is not feasible to do on a person-to-person -person basis, basis around the world, but uh, there are ways, especially with the social amplification work, to kind of mitigate the amplification of it at a minimum. Great. I've got about a zillion questions, so I'm going to shoot right into the questions from the chat. So thank you all, and some of them build on what you've already said. I'm going to start. Uh, I'm going to start actually with a question to, to both of you, it's super interesting. What is, what's unique around vaccine hesitancy? People are hesitant to accept family planning services. Can these all be clubbed together? Or is there something different about vaccines? Adi, do you wanna give it a start? Well, uh, I think th there's different vaccines. <laughs> and I think um, the family planning issues, are, I totally agree. There's a, a word, vaccines are not the only one. I think the thing about vaccines uh, that is really concerning is that it's everybody on the planet. It's every child that's born. Um, mm -hmm. And also with family planning in principle, women should have, or families and parents should have a choice or individuals. Um, and you're at an age of that. I think it's different. Um, I think that the, the real Achilles heel of vaccines is this perception that it's being counted um, by global authorities, by national authorities, it's everybody. It starts from childhood. I think it's the scale of it and the touches everybody's life part of it that is a little different than, I think the reasons are different too. I mean, you do have some similar issues in the sense of rights, right to choice. Um, that. I think is where those two issues um, come together. Uh, Heidi, uh, you used the word concerning. Can you explain what you meant by that? You started by saying concerning about vaccines. And just explain. Well, what's concerning about it is we've created a planet um, that is absolutely dependent. And this is one of the things I read about in, in Stuck is we've created a planet that is absolutely dependent on a number of vaccines right now. If we pull the plug and go under herd immunity on a few of these vaccines, um, we're in trouble because we have had no wild virus circulating for some of these. And we you're saw- with, measles, Can you be specific to some of the diseases you're talking about? Well, I was gonna give the example of measles. We saw what happened in, in 2018, we had masses uh, I mean, very serious cases, some adults dying. Um, we had 20,000 cases in, in Europe. It was extremely serious. Um, and, and that's because we went just below herd immunity. And for measles, that's 95% coverage that you need. So the, the community impact, the population impact when things go wrong with this with vaccines is different than with the, and with it's con, the concern level is that it has a much more population wide impact than individual choice around contraceptives. Not to under, underestimate at all the issues 
in that domain. But just to your question of what's different about it. Robert, do you want to comment on that as well? Yes, I think all public health interventions um, are great uh, as long as they preserve life, um, prolong life, family planning being one of them. Uh, but honestly, we have to be uh, mindful that vaccination is um, one of the, say, greatest innovations that has saved human life and prolonged human life. Um, you could find uh, extremely difficult to find one that has done a greater uh, service to humankind than vaccination. Two, um, it applies to almost to everybody. Um, and then there is a group of people, especially children, who need vaccination but they are not of age to make their own decisions. Their decisions are made purely by their, the gatekeepers, their guardians. And you just imagine in some of the contexts where we live, and I will say specifically Africa, look at the state of the health infrastructure that um, is totally uh, broken down. It's one of the reasons why we struggle with Ebola and DRC. It's one of the reasons why Ebola had a, a great um, a unfortunate impact on the three countries in West Africa. So without vaccination program or vaccines, you would imagine what would happen if it is swept through a, a, such a context where you don't have the right infrastructure to deal with treatment or inpatient of, of those who have been affected. So while others are critical and there could be hesitance in other public health options that are provided in health facilities, I think vaccination is one that um, makes sure that everybody has a, a, a kind of a silver bullet to prevent yourself from any some of the diseases that have caused a lot of loss in this world. Robert, a follow up to you, and then I'll move back to Heidi. What do you think, uh, particularly in your context, what is the role of healthcare workers in creating trust for vaccines? Are they in a position to build trust as people who actually also come from the community? Um, or are they treated as outsiders? They are very crucial in uh, ensuring that uh, that trust continuum is built because imagine mobilized by my community health worker go to the clinic to receive a vaccine. And when I get to this clinic, I am not provided the information I need to know what I am taking. That's one. Two, I am not handled in a manner that I feel is respectful, uh, the dignity of a client. Uh, three, I am not present to actually offer me the vaccine because I've arrived at the clinic, it is closed. So what kind of trust then do you create between that person and the health worker if the experience with the health worker is not one that builds the trust for them to believe in the message they have received to come to the clinic? So one of the reasons why compliance for vaccines is a big problem is because people who want to be vaccinated go to these clinics and they are not well managed. They are not given the right information or they find in my context where I am, they find these places of vaccinations closed down or led to open or early to close. So health workers have a very important role because they're the ones with the sense in terms of the actual facts that people in the community, the mobilizers may not be able to give to those who are interested in vaccination. And if they are not available to bridge that gap in terms of knowledge that have acquired me to come to take the vaccine, then I lose interest as a person who's interested. Then I become a negative influence to the community because I'll then go back and share my own experience based on the health work I've interacted with. So they are very critical in ensuring that people have the right information, which is a critical uh, human right in terms of making the right decision. Thank you. Uh, Heidi, I'm gonna switch gears for a sec. Um, that's, uh... Uh, I'm going to switch gears for a second um, in terms of how, how do you get people to accept vaccines that don't want to? Is there experience, there are two questions around this. One is, are there experiences where financial incentives help people overcome hesitancy? And another question is, um, yeah, that's the first question. Is that a scheme that works? Pay people? Um, 
I'm not convinced about paying people. Uh, I think it also can breed suspicion. Um, I think making it easier for them, making it maybe um, free or low cost um, is is good. I wouldn't pay people to take it just because it, I, I don't know. I, I think some people would not, not trust, trust that. Um, because then it makes it feel like you're doing it for somebody else, which you are in a sense, but it takes the sense of agency and, and why it matters to me. And it, it changes that dynamic, I think. Um, one thing that I have seen, and this was around the HPV vaccine, which we have a lot of um, issues and anxieties around in some, um, H some HPV vaccine human, for cervical cancer? Yeah, yeah, um, and a few other cancers, but particularly against cervical cancer. Um, it was in Denmark where they had a real issue with anxiety about the vaccine. And what they did is they brought a group of HPV vaccinating age girls, teenagers, in with the health authorities. And they together co-created a social media strategy to reach their peers. And I think that idea of that co-creating and creating shared ownership uh, is really was invaluable. I mean, it really helped improve the rates. And I think there are many different ways that could happen. But in this case, social media was the, the medium. But I think that's, that is a good incentive. But certainly, I think making things accessible and available um, are also uh, really incentive. If you make it convenient, you make it accessible, people know when and where to get it. it it's fundamental um, as a start. That, that speaks to what, I guess, what Robert was talking about, making sure the clinic is open, that your that you're, yeah. people can get there. Um, uh, maybe a, a follow-up question on sort of the big, the big picture of this is, are people less hesitant to receive to, if a vaccine exists for something for which there's also a therapeutic, so I could just take in a, a drug and get cured on the back end, does that affect hesitancy or how does that affect hesitancy? Well, it certainly weighs into people's decisions. Um, we've seen, um, for instance, even with HIV, um, having drugs available um, has created more uh, disinhibition in some some groups because you feel like there's there's a way you know there's another way to deal with this um and we've seen this in in other cases but i in the case of covid because we really don't know um well we don't know the effectiveness of vaccines or therapeutics at this point but with this phenomena of lo long covid um, we have a lot to learn. So I, I think the equation of weighing treatment versus prevention will be different, certainly at this stage of our understanding and the public's understanding. Great, thank you, Heidi. Uh, Robert, I assume you're there even though your video is off. Um, there's a question uh, for you, which is, there's a lot of eagerness uh, now that people, um, you know, people are eager about the COVID vaccine because it seems like the solution to the problem. In, in absence of adequate supply, uh, do, do you think this could backfire or do you see a potential for this backfiring? Definitely, it, it's, it would be a big problem. Um, when, when we're beginning the Ebola vaccine studies in Sierra Leone, um, and we began the community engagement to inform the communities that we had, there was a study going on, uh, we needed to volunteer to take the vaccine. The communities were eager. Um, many people wanted to volunteer to take the Ebola vaccine as part of the study. We got hundreds and hundreds of numbers. But uh, phase one of the study, on uh, uh, the first part of the study, only required 43 participants. So you have all these people who have mobilized and eager to take the vaccine, but we only wanted 43. So we had to do a rotary. 
instead of saying walk into the clinic, we had to do a rotary and people had to pick. So the first 43 people in terms of numbers who picked one to 43 were the ones that were selected. Then they went through the eligibility criteria. If you don't qualify, then the next person in that line until you got 43 came in. So imagine now with everything that is going on, the WHO is saying 10% of the global population could have contracted COVID-19 and then the vaccines are not enough. How are we going to undo all the education, the mobilization we have done to tell the communities, sorry, uh, we have to begin with this classification of high risk people. You don't belong to this category. It will create a lot of backlash in the communities. And is one of the things we need to be prepared about and see how uh, we structure any engagements based on the supply that will be coming into the country. The other dilemma that I also see with this is multiple vaccines. You have a vaccine A in a certain region of the country and you have vaccine B in another region and a vaccine C because there are multiple vaccines. We have more than 150 vaccines under development. So you have all these vaccines. Uh, one of the difficulties I see that is going to come up is uh, communities will be asking, how did you select this vaccine to be there and not here? For it, especially if one vaccine is a one dose and another is a two dose. My experience with the community is that many communities prefer a one dose vaccine where they would not return. Once, sure, that's good. No, you don't need me again to come back to your clinic. That's good for me. So if you have a one dose here, a two dose here, they'll say, okay, how did you choose for us to get a one dose? And that community is getting a two dose. So it is going to require a lot of global planning on ensuring that uh, communities and countries are prepared based on the need, realistic need. And that means the logistics of importation, clearance, development will be managed well in a, in a manner that is, is fair for everybody. And it will not be politicized at country level where it is common in the continent where I, I have been working in Africa, that politicians choose their districts as startup areas for such special vaccines. Um, so I know this is going to be a big issue in Uganda, for instance, where I come from, they will be saying, which districts, it will, it, if there are districts, I can say this to you openly, that I would not be very surprised that seven of the districts belong to the politically aligned uh, areas of the country to so that their people feel okay with taking us So I, I am concerned that the eagerness with which we have created on saying the silver bullet is the vaccine and then we don't have enough, how will we address that? Because we are not going to run a rotary honestly, at country level to do vaccination. Pretty, have you, have you ever, have you in your work on, on uh, vaccine confidence, this idea of sort of the people's choice of which vaccine? Um, so there's a question that says, how will the general population distinguish? And as Robert says, there may be two or three different vaccines. How will the, and how, have you seen that play out in a, in a hesitancy or confidence way? Multiple choices of vaccines. Is it a people's choice? How does that work? Well, um, we did see that actually in the beginning with Gavi, um, when there was a lot of um, hype around the Hep B vaccine, uh, but as part of a multiple dose vaccine, but then that wasn't hepatitis B childhood vaccine. Yeah, yeah, and um, it, there wasn't enough of it in the combination vaccine. I mean, there there wasn't enough. And we had like created all this um, uh, enthusiasm. So some people got monovalent single dose and people, the reality is particularly with COVID, the public is not gonna have a choice um, because the government is gonna negotiate from what's available, what they procure. So, which is not a great thing from a public perspective but um, I think in terms of types of vaccine, at least in the beginning, I think a little farther down the road when you know we, we've, there's been an, enough vaccines made, 
there might start to be choices, but we've got time to prepare for that. I mean, we can start, um, we got, we have time if we get going sooner rather than, than later. But again, I think when those decisions are made though, people want to know why, how, who decided, what's the criteria. Um, yeah, and I, I think this, I absolutely agree with Robert about us. Um, we need to be us creating too much expectation uh, and, and it's not there when people want to go to the well to get it. We've seen that at very basic levels in communities that people will walk miles to get a vaccine. There's been a lot of social mobilization around and then they can't get it. And then they don't go back because we'll So I have just a few more questions before we close up, which is, um, I mean, what we've, you've mentioned um, engaging the community. What, what, what do you think are the priorities in terms of educating the, the public around this issue, both at country level and at global level? So there, obviously there have been a number. I said I wouldn't mention on this call uh, our, our commander in chief, uh, but, but I think we, you know, we do have vaccines in all countries that are being pushed quickly. All of the vaccine producing countries, it's not unique to the US are pushing their vaccines quickly. Um, and as you said, there are a lot of new vaccines which have new clinical approval processes, which is also part of why the excitement of why they're getting out so quickly. But how, what, how would you, what would be your priorities on educating the public? Should everybody become a vaccine expert on how, how do we do this? No, I, I, it's, I'm glad you framed it that way because sometimes I think the science, you know, this whole public, under, public understanding of science, we um, push too much the public needing to understand science and not science understanding the public. But um, I, I, I think we need to get people at least the information that they, one, should know and two, want to know. So um, we don't usually get the second part of that very well. Um, one, we don't have all the information now, but I think what we need to do is take people along the journey with us of learning. We should, what we do know now is what the different platforms are and how they're being made. When have you seen anything in the news when you see speed, 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 where do you see in the news people explaining why they're faster? You know, that we had a, a financing facility that we didn't have, for instance, for Ebola. And thanks to what we learned in Ebola, we had it. Um, we have these new platforms. And to help people get a bit more familiar with what that means, but in a, not in a complex way because we'll lose them but at least to share that information because it hasn't been out there in even a basic way, frankly. Great, thank you, Heidi. Robert, your thoughts on this before we turn it back over to, uh, to PHR? I think an ordinary woman and man um, at the community always wants to know the benefit of the vaccine. Why do I have to take this vaccine? Um, what are the benefits to me? Um, that's all that they need mainly, benefit. What is the benefit of taking the vaccine? And then of course, um, what would be the procedure for you to access the vaccine or to take it? And of course, all these communities will ask, supposing I don't feel well after taking the vaccine, what happens to me? Yeah. So those are some of the common questions they will ask. And if we can give them that information, the benefit, the procedure of having the vaccine, and how will you handle me after I've taken the vaccine? If I get a headache, a fever, or I don't feel well, or something happens, many communities will have trust in the process. If you don't give them that information, especially the last one I've talked about, handling side effects, which are normal, they do happen for many of the drugs we take, uh, many people lose trust in the, in the process in the vaccine, even when it is good. That's what I would say. Great. Um, so Heidi and Robert, thank you so much. And I love this idea of scientists understanding the community. And Robert, you've given us a lot of really practical examples of, of how, how to engage communities from, 
you know, trials to delivery. So with that, Donna, I hope this gave you some food for thought and I'll turn it back to you. Amazing. Nina and Robert, Heidi, thank you. This was such a rich conversation, um, informing not just our audience, but informing PHR and, and those of us who are working on these issues. Thank you so much. You have such a keen understanding of this issue and, um, and also your deep insights. So you're helping us to understand the complexities that we're facing and just how essential, Robert, as you said, the role of health workers are in guiding us through this pandemic um, and also transparency this you know, critical component of ensuring respect for human rights. Um, next Thursday, October 15th at 12 o'clock Eastern time, uh, will be the second of our two-part series, focusing on this time the processes, uh, the limitations and challenges of delivering a new vaccine worldwide. Um, and so uh, Nina Schwabli, who will return as our moderator once again, uh, will be joined by another extraordinary panel. So you can register for next week's event at PHR's website where you can also sign up for notifications for all of our webinars and other information related to COVID and the human rights implications. Um, you can also find this recording and uh, 22 others um, on the website. And I would just encourage you to share it with others um, who might be interested or in, are in a position to engage on these issues. Um, thank you all very much again for joining us today. Looking forward to being with you next week. And again, Robert, Heidi, Nina, thank you so very much. Pleasure. Thanks. Good luck, Heidi Robert. Thanks for your work. It's awesome. Bye bye. Thank you. Nice Thank to see you, Robert. Okay, bye. Okay. Nice bye. to see you, Heidi.